Hi, I'm Kaylee Gash, Assistant Professor of Soil Health at North Dakota State University. I've got a little demonstration for you that illustrates how residue chemistry, specifically the carbon and nitrogen ratio of different types of residue, influences decomposition and explain the decomposition process and why that carbon to nitrogen ratio matters and how it relates to decomposition speed. So you've probably heard of people talk about the carbon to nitrogen ratio of different types of residue. That just refers to the relative amount of carbon molecules inside of a substance uh, relative to the amount of nitrogen. And so a higher ratio would indicate less nitrogen rich material, whereas a lower ratio or a narrower ratio means that there's more nitrogen relative to the carbon. So if we think about two different types of residue, uh, here we have wheat straw, which has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 80 to one. So 80 units of carbon to one unit of nitrogen. We know that this is a very high carbon rich type of material. And we'll compare that to straw that's from young alfalfa residue. And that has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 13 to one. So 13 units of carbon for each uh, single unit of nitrogen. So we know that the nitrogen fixing species, which has higher protein content and higher nitrogen content in its tissues, will have a narrower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So for the purposes of the demonstration, we're gonna use Skittles to represent the carbon and nitrogen molecules in different substances. So the purple Skittles are gonna represent carbon and the green Skittles are gonna represent nitrogen. And so, if we're interested in breaking down a type of residue, we can imagine that it has a set ratio. So this residue is representing uh, a substance that has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 10 to one. This would be something similar to that alfalfa straw that we were just looking at. So you can see a lot of carbon relative to nitrogen. And if we wanna decompose this, then we need to have microbes uh, break it down. And as they do that, they're going to consume some of the carbon and nitrogen and use it to build more microbial cells. But they're also going to use some of that material for metabolism, which requires that they respire CO2 uh, up into the atmosphere. Our microbial cells have a very rigid ratio of five to one, and they have pretty strict nutritional needs. The amount of carbon that is going to make its way into the CO2 pool relates to a microbe's carbon use efficiency, or CUE. And we're going to estimate a carbon use efficiency for this microbe to be 50%, which means that for every carbon that goes into making a new microbial cell, another carbon is going to go up into the atmosphere as CO2. So in this example, since we're trying to build more microbial cells with a carbon to nitrogen ratio of five to one, and considering that 50% carbon use efficiency, we'll demonstrate how these microbes break down this residue. So to build a new microbial cell, we need five units of carbon, one unit of nitrogen, and then remember, just as much carbon is going to go up into the atmosphere as CO2. We've successfully broken through this residue. We have nothing left. We have no excess carbon and we have no excess nitrogen, which means that for the requirements that we set up, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio demands of, of uh, the microbial community as five to one and that 50% carbon use efficiency, we have um, completely decomposed the entire pool of residue with no excess nitrogen, no excess carbon. Now, if we look at a different type of residue, maybe something with a much higher carbon type to nitrogen ratio, uh, we can see there's uh, much less nitrogen available. So if we, again, try to decompose uh, this material, given these metabolic demands, um, we end up having an excess of carbon, even though some of the carbon is still making its way up into the atmosphere. So this would be an instance where we have uh, a really high carbon to nitrogen ratio relative to the, to the 
net metabolic needs of the microbial community. And the only way then to break through all of this carbon material is to supplement it with nitrogen. And so these microbes could be scavenging nitrogen from nearby sources, maybe from the soil solution or from available fertilizer in the soil. And they would be then immobilizing that nitrogen so that they could build more biomass using this carbon. And at the same time, they'll be respiring carbon up into the atmosphere. Now, a really low carbon to nitrogen material will give us a different result. So here we have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of two to one. This is, this is such a low or narrow carbon to nitrogen ratio that we don't actually even see this, this carbon to nitrogen ratio in, in um, plant materials or even animal tissues. So again, thinking about the demands of our microbe and wanting to build more microbial cells, we'll go ahead and, and stick to the same rules that we've been following in, in making new microbial cells. So we've burned through all of that residue and we have a lot of nitrogen left. So this would be an instance where nitrogen would be released out into the environment. This is a mineralization process. So now this nitrogen um, can't be used unless we supplement this system with carbon. Again, you wouldn't find a carbon to, to nitrogen ratio of two to one uh, in large abundance in the soil. But you can imagine that as those ratios get lower and lower, you have a higher chance of having a mineralization scenario as opposed to an immobilization scenario as we saw with the higher carbon um, materials. So a couple things to keep in mind as we think about what controls this process. First of all, you saw that the, the chemistry of the starting residue is really important. So high carbon materials, tend to require nitrogen immobilization and the tie-up of nitrogen uh, in microbial biomass in order to burn through and decompose this material, whereas the lower carbon to nitrogen ratio materials um, provide a near perfect ratio for decomposition, or maybe sometimes they would even allow mineralization or of, of the nitrogen or the release of nitrogen into the soil solution. But you also have to remember that this carbon to nitrogen ratio of the decomposer community has a control on how fast that decomposition happens. And so if we were to, rather than have a, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of five to one, uh, which is very common for uh, things like bacteria, um, and maybe we were to bring in a lot of fungi, which have um, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 15 to one, that means that they can burn through these carbon, these high carbon to nitrogen ratio residues a lot faster because for each new microbial cell, they're gonna be consuming 15 carbon units for each nitrogen that goes into biomass, but then they're also gonna be respiring 15 units of carbon into the atmosphere of CO2. So for each single nitrogen unit, they're gonna be consuming 30 units of carbon, which means that these higher carbon residues are a much better food source for fungi relative to bacteria because the bacteria need more nitrogen to build their high nutrient biomass. Also don't forget that we used uh, in this demonstration a carbon use, use efficiency of 50%. And so 50% of the carbon was retained in biomass and 50% was respired. But that carbon use efficiency value can actually vary between 20 and 60% depending on temperature conditions, depending on the makeup of uh, the microbial community, the balance between different types of bacteria, different species and functionalities, uh, and maybe even different types of fungi as well. And so as the percent efficiency increases, the carbon content that's retained in the biomass also increases. So in our demonstration, we were kind of right in the middle of the road, but just know that that use efficiency, that, rel that ratio of how much carbon is uh, respired into the atmosphere versus retained into biomass can fluctuate or be uh, variable in each different ecosystem. Once carbon and nitrogen goes into microbial biomass, 
It's not the end of the story. This, this community of microbes will continue to decompose uh, other substrates and materials in the soil for food and continue to replicate. But they'll also die. And when their dead bodies uh, are decomposed by other microbes, some of this carbon that is that it was previously in their biomass is going to be respired as well. And so we call this the internal carbon cycle where carbon from residues makes its way to the atmosphere through passing by passing through the microbial biomass and that carbon can actually cycle within the microbial biomass many many times before it's ultimately respired as co2 so you might be wondering then how do we actually sequester sequester carbon in the soil or retain it in the soil for a long term because microbes usually only live maybe a few hours to a couple of weeks. Well, when some microbial cells die, uh, their nutrients, whether it be carbon or nitrogen or phosphorus, whatever's in their bodies, might find its way to be stuck to uh, the surfaces of clay minerals or become coatings on other soil particles. And those molecules will then be very tightly held to that uh, physical matrix of the soil. And that is very stable carbon that will reside in the soil for hundreds of years. So what can you control if you're thinking about this decomposition process happening in say a farm field? Well, the microbial community is something that's out of our control. The microbes that are living in a soil at a, any given time are very well adapted for the current conditions, uh, the current climate, the current soil conditions, and the history of management in that location. And so we're kind of stuck with whatever they can do. That means that their carbon use efficiency is also out of our control. However, we can adjust the types of residues that we're feeding into the soil. So let's say you have a corn crop or a wheat crop and you have a lot of high carbon material uh, on the surface or incorporated into the soil. And one of the best ways to speed up the decomposition of some of those residues is to introduce more nitrogen to the system, perhaps by following that crop with something that produces high nitrogen content tissues like a legume. Um, by, by adding a legume to the system, you'll be allowing for more nitrogen mineralization into the soil, introducing more nitrogen to be available to decompose those high carbon residues. Some people are also seeing a lot of success by uh, putting cover crops, very green, um, leafy, forby cover crops into uh, corn and wheat residues. And that also serves the same purpose. So rather than um, waiting until the next sequence in the rotation, you might also have a chance to either interseed or, um, or introduce cover crops after you grow a high carbon residue crop and in the hopes that the, the green leafy material that's produced yet in the fall, once it freezes and dies, uh, it will, and starts to decompose, it will contribute a lot of nitrogen to help break down those residues. I hope this demonstration has helped you understand the chemistry behind decomposition. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and good luck with managing your residues.